All right, guys, this will be lecture number six. Six, yeah. In our series on Bible cosmology, the five worlds of Bible history, science, and prophecy. And we're going to be continuing to look at the pre flood world. We're almost done with the pre flood world. And then we're going to look at that vestibule between the pre flood and the post flood world, that catastrophe we call the Genesis flood. Uh, but let's finish up here with the pre-flood world. Let's look at the form and distribution of the continents and the topography. Uh, Genesis 1 seems to indicate that there was one supercontinent on planet Earth. It says uh, the dry land was ga gathered together. And if you just read the description there, it, it kind of sounds like there was, a, there was one continent. That the, the form and distribution of the continents then is not what it is today. Something has changed. Um, we already looked at this. This is Dr. This is Walt Brown's uh, model. We're going to look at the, his model today uh, for what may have happened at the time of the flood. It's consistent with what we know scientifically, geologically, uh, paleontologically. It's all it's all consistent with all that evidence, and it's consistent with the biblical record too. Is Dr. Brown's flood model 100% correct? I doubt it. But there are, there's a, quite a number of flood models out there being proposed by creation scientists. The hydroplate theory is the model that I hold to right now tentatively. It seems the best. So uh, just as an aid to the memory, Dr. Brown suggests that here is the, the granite that you and I are living on. You know, we kind of live up here on top of the, the uh, continental granite. He suggests that about 10 miles down, there was huge reservoirs of water, subterranean water uh, chambers, uh, pillar-like structures connecting the bottom and the top of the chamber. And uh, so you have basalt beneath the water chambers and then into the mantle, the upper mantle, or the outer mantle of the earth. Uh, he's going to places like Psalm 33 and verse 7, where it says that God gathers up the waters of the sea as a heap, uh, and he lays up the deep in the storehouses. That's kind of cryptic there. It says that God laid out the earth above the waters. So on Dr. Brown's model, the source of the waters of the flood was actually under the earth. And we know that it rained 40 days and 40 nights, and we're going to talk about that yet. But it was not a normal rain. This was a special hard rain that came down. Uh, normal rain occurs when water vapor condenses uh, into a droplet, but there's a heat release too when that happens. So if you think about the amount of uh, condensation that would have to happen, the amount of heat that would be generated to flood the world with a normal rain, it seems that we'd probably be all parbroiled or something. We'd be cooked, sauntered to death. Yeah. So, so Dr. Brown suggests that the source of the water was um, under the earth. Uh, he suggests that the pre-flood mountains were much uh, lower uh, than today's mountains. Uh, and he denies, and I think he has good reason to deny, Pangaea. Yes, we, we think the continents were probably closer together, and they shifted. We're going to talk about that. But they were never together the way the textbooks suggest, this thing called Pangaea, where the continents kind of fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. There are scores of technical objections to this whole scenario. First of all, they got to shrink Africa by 35% to make it work, you know, and uh, you have to manipulate uh, some of these things. If you remove the water and you make 3D models of the continents, they don't fit together quite as good. They do fit pretty good up against this thing called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. We talked about that last time. We're going to explore that a little bit today. Um, and we're going to explain what we think might have happened to shift the continents away from each other, a shift, sudden Limited shifting of the continents, not continental drift. You've heard, who's, who here has heard of continental drift before? I don't believe it. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, we're, we're starting to range beyond the scope of this course, but we could certainly talk about that you know, outside the course if you want to know my reasons for rejecting the whole plate tectonic theory with subduction and plate tectonics and, 
and the continental drift, you know, convection currents float, making continents float around like lily pads on a pond or something. I doubt it. Um, but anyways, if we could just sort of summarize uh, the pre-flood world. First of all, unrestrained demonic influence. That we saw. Uh, mortality was introduced into the, into the human race after sin. A sacrificial system was inaugurated. If you're going to approach God to worship him, you come with a blood offering. We saw that with Cain and Abel. Uh, we also noted today the environment was unspeakably harsh. It was inhospitable. We saw Lamech's cryptic prayer. This boy of mine, Noah, he will give us comfort because of the ground which God has cursed. Right? I just can't struggle anymore. It's just really hard to find something to eat around here. Uh, we suspect lower oceans. Right, because the flood waters mainly came from beneath the earth. Where are they today? Today they're in newly deepened ocean basins. But the flood waters initially under the earth, so the oceans were lower. Perhaps one supercontinent, vast quantities of water under the earth. That's a, see, that's quite different than today. But I will mention, though, uh, geologists have detected vast amounts of water under our earth still there, you know, in certain places. And I can't remember, I think it's... No, don't call me. I'm going to look it up. But I remember they found underneath one of the continents a reservoir of water as big as the Arctic Ocean. Still there. You know. And you're going to see in the next lecture, uh, as we move on here, I'll show you what's happening to Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, is, uh, is spewing water into space right now. Okay, so let's take a look at the flood. We won't finish looking at the flood today, but we'll start. Remember, this is a look at the five worlds of Bible, history, science, and prophecy. So we want to take a look at the flood. First thing we notice, uh, we notice from Peter, the Bible's great cosmologist, Peter, the apostle. He says, in the last days, the scoffers will come. They shall come scoffing, and they will be walking after their own lusts. This is really, really important. Doctrinal heresy has a moral foundation. Yeah, every, you know, it's, it's really weird. I'll just mention it. Because we have unlimited time, right? The course can go as long as we want. We can talk about the things that are important. In my experience, and this is inductive, inductive reasoning, but in my experience, uh, I've known people who said they were Christian. And then all of a sudden, they're not Christian anymore, and they've gone completely off the deep end. They don't know what sex they are anymore. They don't know what, who or what they're going to marry. They're, they're depressed. They're, they, they're into all kinds of um, immorality. And it's just very strange that as long as you believed in God, you were living a certain kind of what we consider to be a, a morally upright lifestyle, and then you want it to live like this. And what a coincidence. You've, al you've also deduced that there's no God. That's a strange coincidence. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of hear what I'm saying? Maybe I'm being a bit awkward with it. But why didn't you just, instead of that, why don't you just say, yes, I believe in this God, but I hate him and I don't like his rules? It's really weird how I think I'm going to live like this. And by the way, I've decided there's no God. I think it's just showing us what Peter's telling us here. If the scoffers that scoff at Christianity are doing so because, because they have a, a lifestyle that they want to live, it's not in accordance with God's wise moral commands, uh, and therefore now they're going to erect their own theological system, whether they craft gods of their own uh, choosing or whether they just deny God outright. It's all, it's all, coming, it's all being built upon a moral foundation. I'm, I'm convinced of that. But these uh, scoffers in the last days, says Peter, they will say this, where is the promise of his coming? They say, we don't believe Jesus is coming back. We just don't believe that. You say there's a second coming, he's going to judge the world. We don't believe God judges the world. And they have an argument. They have a scientific sounding argument. Now here it is. This is really, really important. Uh, I'm not just wasting time here. Peter says, this is what the scoffers in the last days will say. For since the fathers fell asleep... All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's 2 Peter 3, 4. 
The scoffer says, we're not going to have a judgment around here because we haven't seen one before. Whatever's happening right now, that's, that's the only thing that's ever has been happening. Worldwide physical processes have continued as they are right now from the beginning of the creation. It's going to go on like this into the end of the age. And that's called uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism. It's a, it's a worldview, it's a philosophy that has supersaturated the Western world. It is just an idea, an idea adopted by the mind that people now have assumed to be correct. And I want to show you who the modern proponent of this uh, is or was. It's a man named Charles Lyell. You know, these are good names to remember. Charles Lyell. Scottish-born lawyer Charles Lyell took up geology and wrote The Principles of Geology, 1830-1833, an important synthesis of geological ideas that greatly influenced the naturalist Charles Darwin. This is from a Smithsonian Institute publication here. I continue the quote. Lyell believed that the interpretation of the past must be based on an understanding of present processes. He also divided the tertiary into epochs. And uh, I just want to show you something here. Lyell believed, capital B, we could put a capital B if we wanted to. He believed, what? That the interpretation of the past must be based on an understanding of present processes. Believed, must. Look at those two words, it's very important. He has a faith commitment to uniformitarian thinking, strict uniformitarian thinking. And he wrote a book about it. Look at the book says, the principles of geology being an attempt to explain the former changes in the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. He, he's playing a little game. And it's okay to play this game if you want to. It's fine. He says, I'm going to try to explain what's been happening around here. I'm going to explain the geological features of the Earth. But in my game I'm playing, I'm confining myself to only physical processes that I've witnessed in operation right now. And therefore, I can, I'm going to extrapolate backward... And it's going gonna, it's gonna to entail that he adds enormous amounts of time to earth history. But I want you to see this. This is a faith commitment here. He believed this. He believed that he had, to, he had to think this way. Now, again, we're Christians. And we believe in a general uniformity to natural process. We, I use this, I think, at the conference. You squeeze toothpaste this morning. What did you expect when you squeezed the toothpaste? You expect the toothpaste to come spurting out. Why did you expect that? Because you did it yesterday. We have it built into us that things that you experience today are likely the things that you're going to experience tomorrow. Why do you think that way? Because you are an image bearer of God and he told you. He's controlling the whole thing. The universe is not a chaos. It's a cosmos. It's an ordered creation. And there are many verse passages in the Bible that tell us that observed cases are going to be reliable guides to future or unobserved cases. Jesus had a little confrontation with the religious leaders in Luke, the 12th chapter. He said, you guys, you look at the sky, it's red at night, you know it's going to be nice weather tomorrow. Right? Uh, red sky in the morning, you know it's going to be bad. You see the, you see the uh, clouds are coming out of the west, it's going to rain. He says, you can discern the face of the sky. You're using inductive reasoning, it's okay. General uniformity to natural processes, that's something you can reasonably assume because God said so. Right? But this kind of strict uniformitarianism, we reject. Why? Because God says, the same guy who says you can expect general uniformity, the same God says, don't let that thinking go to seed. Don't think you can just extrapolate backward in time in strict uniformitarian fashion because you're going to reach a wrong conclusion about what's been happening here. You will totally neglect the flood. You won't, you won't appreciate the stu stupendous event that the flood was and the colossal amount of geological work that took place. God says, listen to me tell you about earth history. That's important. Charles Lyell said, I'm not going to listen to God talk to me about history. I'm going to look at physical processes happening now only. And in fact, Charles Lyell said it was his duty to free science from Moses. He rejected the books of Moses. 
including Genesis. So Charles Lyell goes out into the world and he sees rocks and canyons and cliffs and layered strata. He sees fossils and he says, I'm not going to let the Bible explain any of this to me. I think all of it got here through slow uniform processes over enormous lengths of time, endless ages of time. And in fact, he split Earth history into uh, what we call the geologic column. We see the rock layers here, names and ages are given to the rock layers. And then the fossils that you're supposed to find in those layers are there superimposed there for you onto the column. The geologic column, friends, doesn't exist anywhere in the world. It's a mental abstraction. And yet it's, the, it's become the secularist's Bible. If you, if you find a piece of limestone, you can't do a radiometric date on the limestone. You have no idea how old it is. What, which period is it from? Is it Cretaceous? Is it Permian? How do you know? You look for fossils. I found a trilobite in this limestone. Oh, now I know it's not Cretaceous. Because all the trilobites went extinct 240 million years before we evolved. That's Permian. See that? How, but how do you know? How do you know they went extinct 240 million years ago? I've got a, I've got a cast of, of a fossil footprint in my museum downstairs. Somebody wearing a sandal has stepped on a live trilobite and squashed it. <laughs> See? This is all very subjective. It's circular. It's fiction. This is a mental abstraction. It's someone's idea. Okay? The point is, we have two philosophies in head-on collision. Bottom line, Charles Lyell said the present is the key to the past. Look at what's happening now. You can extrapolate in strict uniformitarian fashion into the past, and you can reach generally true conclusions about what's been happening here. And, by the way, you can extrapolate into the future too. Same old, same old. The present is the key to the past. The Christian says, I reject that. The Christian says, revelation is the key to the past. God was here. He made the world. He controls the world. He judged the world. God is morally perfect, omnibenevolent. He doesn't lie to his people. Revelation is the key to the past. God said there was a globe encircling catastrophe called the Genesis flood. It lasted 371 days. All the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Thank you. That's what God says, you know. And God says, you trust me or you don't. Right? And we don't compromise on this. So, Any questions so far? Or comments? Anyone have a comment or a question? I know I sound like I'm getting, me and Menno Kalash here, we get a little worked up. But we're not angry with anybody. We're just very passionate about this. I don't yell as much as he does, though. That's for sure. Yeah? It kind of reminded me of something when I talked about um, people forgetting that God, judged, that God judged the world in the past. Mm -hmm. Say when the fairies are saying we never been slaves. Sure, very good. Yeah. That's a very good um, observation there. So for the recording, I don't know if the recording caught it, but uh, Danny reminds us that uh, these people are willingly ignorant of the flood and of God's global judgment, uh, denying and suppressing this, just like the religious, religious leaders in Jesus' time who, uh, who claimed that they had never been slaves. And yet, of course, that's a big part of Israel's history, that they were slaves in Egypt. So that's a good observation, yeah. Uh, they also claimed that no prophet ever came from Galilee. And they got that one wrong, too, right, in their anger. So they, they denied that they were enslaved in Egypt? Uh, they just kind of made a, a blanket statement. It's a, it's a bit nebulous, but they, they said, we, we're, we've never been slaves. And it's difficult to know if they're talking about themselves personally or if this is to be applied to the whole nation. We're not sure. They're son, they call themselves, we're sons of Abraham, right? And we've never been slaves. So it sounds like they're just, just going to sort of skip over those 400 years bondage. Enslaved to sin, that's what I thought. Yeah, it's an interesting observation. And I think your, your observation is legitimate. I think they, they may be saying that. Yeah. But let's, we can study our Bibles and, and decide for ourselves. Okay, just very quickly here, the origins of flood geology. You have two competing worldviews. Obviously, we just looked at that. The present is the key to the past, or Revelation is the key to the past. If Revelation is the key to the past, 
then the Earth's geological features are, have largely come about because of the flood. Right? And so therefore we would call ourselves not strict uniformitarians, but we are catastrophists. Uniformity, uniformitarians say same old, same old. Maybe some local catastrophes here and there, but no globe encircling catastrophe like the Genesis flood. That's, that's the uniformitarian view. We are catastrophists. We say, no, there has been positively stupendous changes on planet Earth, including a, a global catastrophe, a judgment of God, a supernatural judgment, and post-flood catastrophism, we'll talk about in, later in the course, like an ice age, for instance. You know, But um, I heard an atheist by the name of P.Z. Myers, if you ever Google him, be prepared. He's not a very nice man. Uh, he was going on that... Um, uh, flood geology is a very recent phenomenon. Uh, he says that this is invented by the Seventh-day Adventists, if I recall his words correctly. Uh, he is not correct. Uh, when, mod when the modern scientific enterprise really um, got some traction in the Western world, we had men like Nicholas Stineau, John Woodward, John Ray, and others they were all looking at the geological features of the Earth's surface and the fossils that were being discovered embedded in those rock layers. And they were saying, we think that this is evidence of the flood. They, they could tell. Not, Nicholas Stineau, he's considered the father of geology. He said it's pretty obvious to him that the horizontal strata layers that you see uh, out there in the world in places like Grand Canyon, it's obvious that, it, that those were once uh, sediments. In water. It was water that had deposited those layers, you know all over the world. Um, Johann Schutz, is that his name, Schutzer? Is that how you'd say it? Johann Schutzer? He discovered a fossil human, uh, and he, he, he gave it a name that translated means a uh, man who died in the, in the Genesis flood. You know, these, these are the founders of geology, and, and they were seeing evidence of a global flood in the geological record. And in fact, I have a quote here. This is from Stephen Jay Gould. Now, Stephen Gould is dead now, uh, but Stephen Gould is one of the most uh, well-respected, um, sought-after uh, evolutionists. I mean, he, he was an atheist, a die-hard, flag-waving atheist, uh, but a scientist, a, a well-respected scientist. And this is what Gould says uh, about, uh, about the history of science. He said, quote, in fact, the catastrophists, that's us, the catastrophists were much more empirically minded than Lyell. The geologic record does seem to require catastrophism. Rocks are fractured and contorted. Whole faunas are wiped out. To circumvent this literal appearance, Lyell imposed his imagination upon the evidence. The geologic record, he argued, is extremely imperfect, and we must interpolate into it what we can reasonably infer but cannot see. And then he says this, the catastrophists were the hard nosed empiricists of their day. So we know that Charles Lyell, uh, who is the father of this uniformitarian thinking, we know that he fabricated data. He falsified data. He, was, he absolutely lied about how fast uh, Niagara Falls is eroding its banks to bolster his uniformitarian claims. And Stephen Gould, who knows about the history of science, or knew about the history of science, uh, he says it was the catastrophists. It was those guys that were seeing evidence of the flood. They were the real empiricists of the day, not Lyell. And I think that's pretty important. This is why Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 5, these people are willingly ignorant. Ignorant of what? They are willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. See, now that's kind of interesting. It, it kind of goes along with what Dr. Brown is suggesting. The earth is in the water and out of the water. It's kind of a strange way to put it, hey? Peter says, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. It's a very strange statement, but it might be referring to something like this. The earth out of the water and in the water. Perhaps. Peter says, God spared not the old world. But save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing, upon the, flood, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Uh, there's not much evidence left from that pre-flood world. 
it's gone. The purpose of the flood was to obliterate the whole thing, right? Um, but look at Noah. Noah is a preacher of righteousness. And I, I might end with this thought here, you know, uh, so that we don't have to rush through these things. The Bible says that Noah was upright in his generation. And, you know, Noah wasn't perfect, was he? Plants a vineyard and gets totally drunk afterwards. You know, he, that's a very sad narrative, Genesis 9. He, we're being reminded that, that, that we're not perfect. Not even our heroes are perfect. The best of men are men at best, right? But Noah was upright in his generation. And, you know, friends, the, 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 the deeper the darkness gets, the further even a little light will shine. And, and Noah, imperfect Noah, he shone pretty bright, I think, in that pre-flood world. And I remember, if I could just use a little story that I heard from Dr. John Whitcomb. Uh, Dr. Whitcomb was in the U.S. military in World War II. And he said that uh, they would travel across the ocean in these huge troop ships. And they were told, at nighttime, don't you dare go on deck and have a cigarette. Because there's enemy submarines out there with periscopes. And you strike a match, they will see it. From miles away, they'll see it. When the darkness is very deep, a little light goes a long way. And, uh, and Paul reminds us, doesn't he, in his letter to the Philippians, that we are to shine like lights in the world. We're to be sons of light shining in the world. And I think it, it, as the world gets worse and worse, it won't take very much to show the world that you're a disciple of Jesus. Jesus said in, in the, at, at the end times, when it gets really bad around here, when the darkness is so deep, if you give a cup of cold water to one of his disciples, we'll know who you are. The world will be aligned against Christ and his people. Just give a cup of cold water. We know, we know what you're like. You see, you don't have to do a spectacular thing when the world is that bad. right? I just kind of think this was the world of Noah's time. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. This is Genesis 6, 13. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence uh, through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. This is really important. Between Genesis 6 to 9, you're going to get 30 references to the global extent of the flood. And I think that's really important because we have people today who believe the earth is actually billions of years old. Christians. They think the earth is billions of years old. Each creation day was millions of years, maybe hundreds of millions of years. And they say they believe that because the geolo geological record shows millions of years. They're listening to Lyell. See? And so then you ask them, listen, if the geological record with the fossils and the layers and the canyons, if that is the evidence for millions of years, then where's the evidence for the global flood? Because what you're seeing is either the product of millions of years or it's the product of the flood. Which one is it? And these compromisers will say that the, the flood of Noah's day was only local. It was just a little thing. A Mesopotamian local deluge. The rest of the world just kept going on. you know. But we're told here by God, he's going to destroy the earth. And you're going to see it next time we get together that God is very clear. This year-long flood covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. That's why Noah had to put birds on his ark. <laughs> you know? That's why Peter draws a parallel between the global catastrophe in the days of Noah, a global judgment, and a global judgment when Jesus returns. 2 Peter 3 goes on to talk about the global judgment at the return of Jesus. Global flood, global judgment at the second coming. You know, you don't say, oh, local flood back then? I guess it's just a local flood or a local judgment when Jesus comes back. Maybe I can go hide under a bed somewhere. He won't see me. That won't work. <laughs> Global judgments, right? Okay, I'm going to just close right there with that. And uh, next time we get together, we'll look at the flood. We'll look at the ark. We'll look at some neat things that went on. Uh, on the ark and in the world outside the ark, too. And some of the geological work that took place. Any questions at all before we close out this lecture? Questions or comments? It's quite a lot to think about, hey?
Okay, guys, let me pray for you, and then you're welcome to hang out and visit as long as you like, and I won't reel you in <laughs> again. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you, Father. Thank you for being good and kind to us. Thank you, God, that you gathered us here in safety to, to contemplate things that are, that are very, very significant. Uh, thank you, Lord, that we're, we are reminded that uh, you have a zero tolerance for sin, that you will judge sin, and you will judge unregenerate man and unrepentant sinners, you will judge. And Lord, help us to know and believe and confess that the judge of all the earth does right. Uh, Lord, even in these last of days, we ask for your wisdom and courage. We ask for a godly heart and disposition as we are about Father's business in the world. Please bless, dear Father, and protect every saint that's under this roof today. May it be so, O oh God, in the coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, God bless you all, and thanks for coming out.